Um, we're, we're, we're doing this event to, to discuss uh, classical music education, the role that technology can play in classical musical education. And one of the reasons we're doing that because my company, Artist Works, uh, has recently launched a classical music campus where uh, the average musician to above average musician can work with some of the top uh, classical musicians in the world to uh, improve their, their, their playing and to uh, get a competitive event for, uh, advantage for auditions and uh, uh, competitions. Um, it's a first of its kind uh, online school uh, where, where you can work with top, top players from major metropolitan orchestras across the, the United States uh, as well as uh, teachers at exclusive universities and conservatories. So we're very excited about that and very excited about having all these gentlemen with us uh, today here. Uh, I'd like to take a, a moment to introduce them. Uh, first of all, we have uh, our French horn teacher who is the principal horn for the Pittsburgh Orchestra and he also teaches at Juilliard. Um, uh, his, his name Carnegie is Mellon. Bill Caballero. Welcome, Bill. Thank you. And Carnegie Mellon. You guys fill in. Uh, okay, Car I teach you Carnegie Mellon. Okay. I'm you, driven by there, Juilliard. There's, there's no shortage of qualifications and affiliations here, so I'll let you guys jump in and fill in where I leave off. Uh, okay. Second, uh, to Bill's left, we have uh, Ricardo Morales, principal clarinet with the Philadelphia Orchestra and teacher at the Artist Works uh, Online Clarinet School. Uh, uh, Ricardo teaches also with the Curtis Institute. And where else do you teach, Ricardo? At the Juilliard School and at Temple University. Ah, you're Juilliard. Bill is Carnegie Mellon. I got you now. All right, so great. And then next to Ricardo <laughs> is Nick. <laughs> and yeah, uh, Ricardo likes to have a good time, as we know. <laughs> uh, and all you guys like to have a good time. And that's, that's one of the things that makes the, the, the schools really great, is as, as students and as, um, as uh, uh, community members within the schools, uh, not only do you have some really serious teachers, but you have some really, really uh, interesting guys who have accomplished a lot, and, and, and uh, ladies as well. Um, also with us is Nathan Cole, who is first associate concertmaster and violinist with the LA Philharmonic, and also a teacher of our upcoming, is going to launch in the next couple of weeks, uh, our upcoming violin school. So Nathan, welcome. Hello. And to Nathan's left, uh, we have Jeffrey Kaner, who is principal flute with the Philadelphia Orchestra. Jeffrey also teaches at the Curtis Institute as well. And uh, Jeffrey uh, records many, many CDs, very well-known uh, flutist. Uh, Jeffrey, welcome. Uh, very glad to be with you all. Great. I also, and, I'm also teaching at Juilliard and at Lynn University in Florida. Perfect, perfect. Um, and do, do we arrive at whether it's flutist or flautist, or is that the debate we're going to have today? It's flutician. Flutician. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, uh, and to uh, my left is a student at uh, one of the schools, the trumpet school, David Bilger's uh, trumpet school. Uh, his name is George Goad. George, welcome. Hello. Nice to have you with you, with us. We're going to get the 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 point of view of someone who's uh, who's gone through the school and kind of talk about it. Um, to his left, we have the founder and CEO of AOL. Uh, no, excuse me, of Artist Works, <laughs> David Butler. Uh, David uh, originally started as uh, one of the uh, early technologists at AOL and was with them through their huge growth all the way through uh, 28 million subscribers. And we'll talk a little bit about that history as well. But welcome, David. Thank you. Glad to be here. All right. Uh, to David's left, we also have um, uh, David Bilger, another David, uh, who is uh, our trumpet school teacher, as well as principal trumpet for the Philadelphia Orchestra, as well uh, a, an instructor at the Curtis Institute. And uh, David, fill in for me your other and, teaching affiliations. And Temple University and the University of Georgia. Great, great. Now, uh, a couple of people couldn't join us today. Uh, we have uh, Jason Vio who was having some uh, technical difficulties, he's, he's on the road. And we can talk about sort of how sort of on the road and working and being in different places kind of plays into the, the kind of school that we have here uh, a little bit later. But uh, 
Uh, in this instance, it's been a little bit of a barrier for Jason. He may pop in as, as we're going along. Um, but uh, Jason Vio, who teaches uh, guitar, uh, classical guitar uh, at the classical campus here at Artist Works, and uh, Jason is an, uh, co-founded the guitar department at Curtis Institute, and he's also uh, a teacher at uh, the Cleveland Institute of Music. So um, Jason uh, has had a, a school with us for a couple of months um, and uh, has been very well received. And uh, the other person who couldn't join us with is Christy Peary. Uh, Christy teaches our classical piano school. So, so with that, I kind of wanted to, to start the discussion just talking to, to you all about, uh, you know, the, the title of the, the presentation is, oh, and I should say, just housekeeping-wise, um, if you have questions, which we are getting questions, um, those questions you can ask on Twitter. So if you have a Twitter account, just simply tweet out your question, but include the hashtag ArtistWorksClassical. Uh, and that's a pound symbol, ArtistWorksClassical. Tweet it out. We'll see it. And uh, those, those will be fed to me uh, to, to ask uh, our panel here today, in addition to the, to the discussion that we're going to have. And if you don't have Twitter, uh, you can post to our Facebook wall and, um, and uh, just post a question on our Facebook wall, and we'll be uh, monitoring that as well. So I'm curious as to what uh, you guys think. Um, you know, classical music has not been at the forefront of technology uh, in people's minds, I think, in terms of, uh, you know, the way that technology has influenced a number of other genres of music. Um, I'm just curious as to whether it's iPads or whether it's scheduling or anything, just sort of where you see and sort of where uh, you experience technology creeping into classical music world, both as a working musician, as a teacher, um, and as uh, you know, a, a performer. Uh, I'll ask Nathan first, since you're uh, large on my screen here. <laughs> well, for one thing, YouTube. Um, that has been huge. Everybody that I teach is on YouTube. They're, they come to lessons and they tell me, oh, I saw this or that. And, you know, do you recommend that fingering or well, I saw this tempo, you know, is that right? And so it's just, that is really, that's here to stay. People love the ability to, to watch videos. Um, and the problem I've seen with that is that the, the quality, the access is great. There's tons of quantity, but the quality has not always been wonderful. So someone will say, I saw someone do this on YouTube, do you recommend it? And I'll watch the video and I'm, no way, I don't recommend that. That's, I don't know who this is. And, it's, you know, someone with uh, their webcam in a, in a dorm room. And um, so I, I really see this, uh, this ability to put out high quality videos that really target exactly what students need. Um, I see that as really part of the future. Yeah, I think that's a really great point about uh, this YouTube access. Uh, it's happened countless times where I've had a student come and play something and I've asked them, you know, mystified. Have you listened to a recording of this? And they say, yeah, I did. I listened to a recording on YouTube. I said, who's recording? And it turns out to have been, you know, Joe Blow for his graduation recital at, at some place. And, and, you know, you have to explain to people that just because something is out there on the web, it's not necessarily something that you should emulate. So the idea of having a website out there that, that has examples of how to do things by people who really know who then the student can actually interact with. This is an absolute tremendous resource uh, for kids who maybe wouldn't be able to go take a lesson live with uh, any of the people on this panel. Uh, it's, it's a fantastic resource. And, and that's a good, oh, I was going to say, that, that's kind of, sorry about that, just, just to give a context, everybody, that's a good point to just maybe insert here, kind of talk a little about exactly what the schools do here at Artist Works, because it's a, it's a big part of sort of how how uh, us we on the panel are, are, are sort of in trying to influence the the situation. Um, and maybe David, you can kind of describe uh, the artist works method, uh, the classical school, how these these schools work, and what makes them different than just uh, say uh, an online school where I'm looking at videos or YouTube videos. David Butler. Yes, uh, hi, yeah, Ian, you're starting to break up, so I fear that since we're on the same connection, I might be breaking up as well. Can no, I, I see you, me and hear me? You're doing just fine. Doing fine. Yeah. 
I'm sorry. Yeah, now I'm losing you again okay, too. Okay. Well, let me let me take that. Um, the 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 main thing the main thing that I think David would would say if he wasn't having technical <laughs> would be um, the the concept of artist works classical campus and and the concept of all artist work schools um, is the concept of taking uh, a, a very accomplished musician in their field uh, someone who who has achieved something uh, of a very high order and uh, providing access to a lot of people instead of just a few. I mean, teaching at Juilliard, teaching at Carnegie Mellon, teaching at Curtis, these are very exclusive universities or conservatories where, where maybe just a few students a year can have access. And um, so with the Artist Works method, uh, an artist can come in. We uh, shoot an entire lesson list cu curriculum, uh, which basically represents that particular artist's musical legacy in, in, in a lot of senses. Uh, it's everything they've learned in their career to that point. And uh, we, we do those in order um, for the classical campus. There will be a number of videos recorded, really with a focus on not taking you from Mary Had a Little Lamb to you know, uh, Mozart, but uh, taking uh, someone who has a level of competency with their instrument, uh, teaching them, uh, providing curriculum around core fundamentals, but also focusing on uh, the etudes, the um, the uh, orchestral excerpts, the solo pieces, the kinds of things that an aspiring musician or even a working musician uh, who is uh, ambitious um, can use to to uh, perform better in auditions, competitions, etc. But the main thing is that the student can work through these videos in a very linear fashion, and uh, at any time that they want, uh, our what we call our video exchange. Um, platform allows the student to show their instructor what they're doing at any given point. Uh, show that their technique to the to the instructor, and the instructor can then, just as they would in a private lesson, view that 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 person's uh, practice and uh, provide a, a response video to that person that hones in on the things that they're doing well and the things that they need to improve upon. And then those two videos are paired together with the lesson on the site for the entire student community to see. So, um, so you know, I, I, it's akin to uh, sort of a master class where, uh, online, where everybody sort of gets uh, individual attention from, from the instructor. And, and the value there is that you get access to these amazing musicians, and at the same time, they're able to work it into their busy schedule. You're able to work it into your busy schedule, and there is a, you can study at your own pace um, when you have time and you have access to this material on a continual basis, so you don't come away from the from the lesson and wonder what was he saying about uh, you know my vibrato or what what was she saying about you know my my pitch. Um, you have that there to work over, and you also can look at other students' exchanges with the teacher. So that's sort of the primer on on, on the method there, and and I'll throw it back out to you guys. Um, you know, uh, how do you think? Uh, that compares to a private lesson. So you know, let's say someone did have the means to fly to Philadelphia or fly to New York or, or and, and take a, and, and could afford a private lesson with you. What do you think are the, the differences between, or do you think there's a difference? Well, this is a, a great time actually to let uh, George, uh, our, uh, our student, uh, jump in and answer that because George is a student of mine at the Curtis Institute and was one of our beta testers on the site and got to, he can compare what he gets on a daily, you know, weekly basis with a live lesson with what he was able to get um, through, um, through a video exchange and uh, going through the curriculum on the site. I think uh, he could give us uh, sort of the student's point of view about what, what it means to, to compare those two methods of learning. So what I've, I've in using the website, I've really enjoyed, uh, obviously, the catalog of uh, technique, uh, and excerpt sections are just an amazing resource for students and the video exchange has been something new and I was very curious about uh, because that's what a lesson means it's you know you play and you get the response and how you navigate that through technology is the big question um, and I think the biggest issue uh, to confront if you're going to be a, a good student and make use of it is to have a good microphone 
and make sure that you have a decent setup. I mean, I, I didn't buy a special webcam or anything, but I have a decent one. Uh, so then you can get a good representation of your sound and uh, use it that way. And uh, what's interesting about these exchanges is most of them are, are, are kind of short on the shorter end. Uh, I'd say from the students, and it usually kind of like in a lesson, uh, you, you're, you're on the receiving end, so you present for a moment. Uh, so you usually send, a, as a student, a video of maybe two, two and a half minutes, and you'll get about five back from an instructor. And so, I mean, this is something that, in looking at the pricing, I said, okay, how can they charge this much? But if you're going to be doing these, you know, it's kind of like a lesson, but it's broken up into these little categories that you're going to be able to see. Okay, here's five minutes, five minutes, five minutes. That times twenty is an hour. Uh, you know, with with one of these great teachers. Uh, so, I've I've thought that the, the technologies work great. Uh, the teachers. I mean, I've only got to play with one teacher, uh, but he had great mics set up, and I felt like I could hear everything he said and. We, we actually tested it out in person. I took the etude that I did on the exchange to him in my next lesson, and it sounded a lot better without working on it there in person because I heard the suggestions and I played it, and he exclaimed, video exchange works. And <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, that was actually a, a great point because uh, George walked into his lesson, and that was the first thing he said is, it works, it works. And I said, yeah, it sure does. <laughs> now, I just so, had a similar experience with... Uh, a student of mine who was a beta tester who I heard play one of the pieces that was uh, on the website, one of the solo pieces, and I'm listening to him play and I thought, have you played this for me already before? And I realized he hadn't. He'd just done the video exchange thing and, and had gleaned a lot from it that I would have told him in person, but uh, he'd, he'd already gotten from the experience of having looked at the and worked on it from having uh, after having uh, worked on it through the exchange. It's fantastic. What else? Another thing that I, I realized quickly about the site was that there's a huge value to uh, to the student sending not a whole movement and not necessarily even a whole section of a movement, but even something so simple as a single phrase, because I realized that in responding to the student, I can get much more detailed uh, and much more complex uh, the shorter the uh, the excerpt that is sent to me. When you send a, a, a whole movement, then the, uh, the comments have to be much more generalized in order to address the the issues of the whole movement. But with a single phrase, you can really uh, go into great detail, and in some ways much more detail than one might be able to in a lesson when you have to get through perhaps a, a whole piece within a certain time frame. Yeah, and I think an important thing there is, you know, you have a student who has this this resource that they've used, and obviously you know this particular student, but you know what a great advantage to have as a student to be able to augment what you're doing with any formal training that you may be doing through a university or conservatory to be able to you know access a resource like this to, to, to then be able to go to your teacher or in your particular curriculum and, and have made huge strides. Um, or measured strides, at least, you know, with, a, with something that you can augment for, for about the cost of, for a little more than the cost of a private lesson. So that's, that's, that's really a, a nice feature. One other advantage, may I say, is that I have uh, noticed that uh, when the uh, students are able to send a tape and they, they video themselves, uh, it, one thing that is advantageous as compared to uh, a lesson, a, a private lesson is that they are in their comfortable surroundings, so therefore they can do the video several times before they have something that uh, they feel that can represent more what they do instead of, you know, the, the, usually when you are teaching somebody who's new, there's the first half hour of the jitters and everybody's, uh, you know, they're usually a little nervous and, and, and therefore you have to go over things over again once they does settle. And, and this also gives a better opportunity to be more precise about the information that they be able to get. Another thing I've noticed is um, the fact that the students will record themselves and then they'll be able to listen back to what they've recorded several times. Listening back after I've coached, they can hear the things that they were doing, where oftentimes in a lesson, I'll, I'll, a live lesson, I'll say to someone, did you know, notice you were doing that? And they'll be, well, I'm not sure, maybe. 
<laughs> and they can go right back on the site and, and listen back to their performance and hear um, exactly what I was talking about in the performance. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I was ahead, say that it, it encourages your self-evaluation more than, I mean, it's a little, a little more of a task when you record yourself in a lesson and go back through the lesson and find that chunk, because I, I record my lessons and go back and find to hear what you were talking about, but when it's in that clip right there, you can see it, and it's, it's very accessible, and it just does encourage that great uh, exercise of listening to yourself and self-evaluation, yeah. Really good. Yeah, a couple of other points. Uh, can you guys hear me? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Just a couple of other quick points about the way we've structured this is the students do send in short videos, but the point of it is they send them when they're ready, so the student is going at their own pace. They can send just the thing they're working on and get the feedback on that particular skill or that particular passage and work on it, and when they're ready, then they can submit another one. Um, as opposed to private lessons where they're scheduled and you kind of have to show up no matter where you are in your working and you may not be ready and so that provides that or, or causes that sense of nervousness that Ricardo was talking about because maybe you know another day and you, you would have really been ready or maybe you were ready two or three days ago and you're just kind of waiting uh, for your lesson. Mm -hmm. So uh, I really like the, the notion that it's um, at your own pace. And then the second thing is there's an efficiency, you know, to get uh, a private lesson with one of these people. They're, they're teaching handfuls of students in their um, teaching because that's all the time they have. These are busy performers. They're not full-time teachers. So how do you find a way that these teachers can really be available to, to maybe less great students somehow? And so the, the skill here is that they do a lot of the teaching in the pre-recorded curriculum. So they have that efficiency. They're not having to restate those things over and over again. So what they're looking now is to see how the student's doing with that curriculum. So that's what they're checking in the video exchanges. So there's an efficiency there. But there's a second efficiency, and that is when there is a video exchange with the student, they are made available to all of the students in the school. So when you uh, are working on a passage, you can get feedback from your teacher, obviously, but the other thing you can do is you can go and see what the teacher has told other students about that passage, and very often you'll find things in what he's told other students that will help you with what you're playing. So there's an efficiency there, and it means that when a teacher is making a video response to a student, he's not only talking to that student, he's reaching an entire community of players. So again, it's a leveraging efficiency thing that makes it possible for individual teachers to reach hundreds of students all at the same time. Which is a so, major difference. Um, I, I'd done some distance learning stuff um, using Internet 2 and actually giving uh, live one-on-one -on -one lessons using that technology, but the fact that you can reach out to an entire community and have this um, individualism, but at the same time, uh, like a giant master class, I think is really unique to this site, and that's why I'm really excited about being a part of this. Yeah, and that and that kind of goes back to David. I want to go back to you because um, uh, you know your background is in technology, and you're also uh, a a musician as well. And I know that um, part of your story and, and how Artist Works came to be was um, sort of applying that one to many kind of uh, ratio. Uh, and, and for not only just a, a technological challenge, but you know, there's a bit of a philosophy behind that. I think, uh, in some ways, the classical campus is is uh, certainly to date the highest achievement of that in terms of uh, democratizing uh, uh, music, um, allowing uh, people access to higher levels of music that that wouldn't be able to do it. And one of the questions we have over Twitter here is. Why is access to classical education in such rare air? Shouldn't the goal be to encourage new students to, to, to grow the pot? Isn't, isn't this somewhat antithetical? So maybe, David, you can talk a little bit about your journey in, in, in founding Artist Works and, and also talk about the, the, the philosophy behind it. Well, that was a great question that came in over Twitter. And uh, obviously, I believe that we should find ways to make these great teachers available. To, um, to more than just the, the very few who would qualify to get into, say, a Juilliard or into a Curtis. These are very small numbers, 
and it's really limiting the influence of these teachers. Um, they're taking people who show up already very good players and they're making them even better players, but they're really not doing much to uh, broaden music education throughout the world. So that's what Artist Works is, is really trying to do. Um, my personal story, when I um, started Artist Works, I, I tell people it was a sort of a happy accident. I didn't really set out to start a company. I was trying to get some music lessons, basically. Um, my particular uh, uh, instrument is guitar, and I was trying to learn jazz guitar. And I just could not find a qualified teacher that was within an easy driving distance of my home. And so I started taking lessons from an individual who lived very far away, uh, commuting. And um, eventually I moved again and was even further away. And with my knowledge of the internet, uh, I just figured there had to be a better way to get some instruction. You know, I was a more or less a, an intermediate player, not even an advanced player. So he could tell me very simple things, and I would be totally happy. To, to get that instruction uh, from him without having to go physically to him. And I tried a whole lot of things. I tried uh, Skype lessons and um, iChat and all these various things, um, and nothing seemed to work. And you can see, like in the technology we're using here today, all of the latency and the hangs and the synchronization issues, and it makes this sort of technology difficult to do for music lessons. Uh, I know some people do it and it works okay, but I thought it wasn't really the best solution. Uh, and there are still issues of syncing up your calendars with individuals, and, and in, for the teacher, there's still the inefficiency that it was they're teaching one teacher, one student at a time. So just thinking about it and thinking about what I had learned about the internet and online services and connecting people together at uh, AOL, uh, it just occurred to me that we could create these little. I called them originally mini AOLs that were centered around a particular music method and allow people to subscribe to these methods and have access to the teachers. And, and I took I hope, the idea that it was a community experience. And so that's why from the very first video exchange that we did, the idea was that everybody would see them. Uh, a lot of people argued that uh, people wouldn't like that because they would feel like they were exposing their players you know, it wouldn't be private. But in fact, what we find is we set up these communities which become very supportive communities. And, and, and because you subscribe, you have to really want to be there in the first place. And what will typically happen is the students always respond in a very supportive way. The comments that come in are always, you know, I really like the way you did this, or I remember when I had that problem you're having, and uh, here's what I tried, and everything becomes very positive. So, that's how we got started. It was just me trying to get at uh, my music teacher, um, and it worked very well. And so I got a lot of interest from other teachers who wanted to work with me. And so we uh, continued to develop the technology, and we did some jazz sites, and we did a whole suite of bluegrass sites. And, and the co-founder of Artist Works, my wife Patricia, is a classically trained flutist who uh, is friends with Jeffrey. And she really wanted to uh, introduce uh, this concept to the classical music world. And that's how we came to, to do this site. Uh, we started with Jeffrey, and Jeffrey brought all these other great musicians to us. And now uh, we have uh, 22 schools with the, the new classical campus. And that runs the gamut from uh, multiple styles of guitar to the drums to bass to the full bluegrass complement of instruments. And now, this uh, you know amazing array of uh, classical schools, um, and and I'm I'm interested so that I'm very fascinated with this whole concept of 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 making high level classical music instruction um, uh, available to uh, a larger much larger number of people, and 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 to me that has a lot of sociological impact. Um, you know this is a tradition that's been handed down, and you guys know a lot more about it than I do. It's been handed down for for centuries. Uh, in a very rigid way, and it seems to me, just in having conversations with most of you, that this is, this is a way that's very exclusive. It's winnowing in on very uh, uh, talented students and 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 trying to call the herd. And correct me if I'm wrong, but there's sort of a culture of uh, high competition, which is great for for getting you know to to the highest level of performance and the highest level of mastery, but maybe not so great for 
the longevity of the art form and and the the, the breadth of, of the influence of that art form. So I'm curious as to what our panelists, uh, our, our teaching artists and performers here, uh, feel about that aspect of it. Well, I can say that when the LA Phil went down to, we went down to Caracas, Venezuela this year uh, for a week and a half, and we got a chance to meet some of the more than 200,000 children there in Venezuela that are part of El Sistema, uh, the great youth orchestra system there. And, you know, these are kids who really start out with nothing, and they get instruction there, and it's a way it builds confidence, it builds a structure to the society. Um, but, you know, they're limited to the instructors that are there. And just a quick story that when we were leaving one of their performances, I felt a tug on my arm and uh, someone who spoke very little English, and I, unfortunately I don't really speak any Spanish, just said, Maestro Nathan Cole, and I looked down and he said, uh, YouTube Schumann, because I had once put a video of myself playing that piece and he was working on that piece and he recognized me from the video. And it just, the more of this that's out there, um, people will see it. And in that case, I mean, they have, as I say, more a couple hundred thousand kids that are eagerly studying. They're dying for instruction. Yeah, and, and, and to be clear, I know that most symphonies have, you know, large outreach uh, programs and educational programs for that very reason, to, to, to spread the influence. But, you know, how, how do you see, how do you all see this technology aiding in that? Or do you see it, or do you have a, a point of view about that? Well, first of all, it's it's one on one, um, which is not what usually happens in the kind of uh, larger scale outreach that symphony orchestras do. So we we end up um, exposing um, students to music, but we don't end up really doing significant education in those projects. This this through artist works, someone in Idaho or or in Brazil or you know you know pick a place um, is going to get access to the kind of instruction that they may not be able to, to get you know it's just not going to be out there without this kind of, of, of a product um, the school is going to reach people who've never been had access before and that's that's I love the term the democratization because it, it does allow people to get the kind of access that they haven't had before anybody else I was thinking about technology and classical music. I mean, for the uh, the student in the 50s and the 60s, it was the, the the record that we listened to, and it started out with you know from 78s to 33s to eight track cassette to CD, and that was obviously an important tool. I'm not that old, believe me, but uh, but it was an important tool that that was used all the way. But at the same point that you know, TV is as well. You saw uh, the Pittsburgh and the Previn. You saw Boston Symphony. You saw New York. You saw Bernstein with the the youth concerts that he was doing. So it was all there. But at some point, I think with technology, with all the changes with happening with uh, with uh, games, video, et cetera, et cetera, in the, in the early '80s and other things, like computer technology, classical did kind of get pushed in the in the back a little bit. And and, uh, and 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 that's also showed in the sense of record sales too. That there's a tremendous dim uh, diminish there. But what's happened, I think, with the with the, uh, the opportunity of artist works it is an opportunity for the student or people that they see this that 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 is there. Besides this exposure, it's 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 combining classical uh, with technology very well. And 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 I think with the very savvy. Uh, a student or even adult with computer technology uh, that, that's out there, they they find this, they 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 use it. Hopefully, they use it in this opportunities there, and and it's also word of mouth too. I think word of mouth is really important. I think once one person starts doing it, taking uh, taking advantage of it, hey, have you have you tried this? Check this out. They have they have uh, their their bluegrass. They have their percussion. They have these other things, and it and it will catch on. And I think there's a tremendous staying power with this. Yeah, I think it's actually uh, incredible how easy the technology has become right. for people to do. I mean, it's not as though uh, at first when the whole idea was brought up to me, was presented to me, I, who am not at all technologically um, sophisticated, the idea was just a little bit intimidating. Uh, but actually navigating how to do this stuff, it's remarkably easy. And, uh, of course, if I ever have 
difficulties, I called my youngest student to find out how to do it because they always <laughs> look better than, than anyone who's any older. Um, but also with the uh, the elimination of school music programs uh, or the you know serious cutbacks in those programs, uh, music education is um, really in a bad state in this country. And uh, this is a way for uh, students who are, you know, working on uh, any number of projects from all state uh, competitions or, um, you know, any, any type of audition that might be happening to get access to uh, information which they might not be able to get at school anymore or from, uh, from information that their teacher at school, their band or orchestra teacher, can direct toward uh, this site where there can be a uniform sort of approach to uh, a vast amount of repertoire uh, which would be tremendously useful for these uh, young people. It's yeah, I, I kind of alluded to it at the beginning, but really the focus of all of the schools is really around those orchestral excerpts that you're going to be uh, expected or, or likely to be expected to perfect in audition. So I would imagine that's, that's for students. And that's also for uh, for uh, semi-professional, professional working musicians, whether that's in an orchestra pit, trying out for a symphony, trying out for a small regional, stepping up to a larger symphony. Does that make sense? Does that sound about right for you guys? Oh, yeah. I mean, many of the people... Oh, go ahead, Ricardo. No, please, please. Um, well, many of the people that uh, take lessons with me already have professional jobs, and they, they simply want to get a different job. And so this kind of thing is perfect for them. They, they know what they're looking for. They can go right to it and then, you know, see it repeated online. Yeah, so we have a, a Twitter question here. Uh, video exchange lacks real-time feedback and interaction. How would you incorporate it into your model? Uh, I'm not quite sure what that question is getting at. Sometimes it's difficult to get these little 160 character things, which is actually... I could, I could, uh, I could take a stab at it at the end. Sure, David. Um, so real-time, uh, we think of real-time, okay, when you take a private lessons, that's real-time um, education, obviously, and you, you can ask a question and get an answer uh, right then, and that's great. Um, uh, so how do you how would you get access to these guys? Well, you'd have to go to Philadelphia or Pittsburgh or LA and uh, find a time that you are both available, and then you'd sign up and take your lesson, uh, and that's real time. Uh, a second kind of real time might be a Skype or an iChat sort of technology, which is real time where you have the teacher's attention; they're on their computer, and you are on your own computer, and that would be great. Uh, if everybody could do it, but you have similar constraints, you have to find a time when the teacher would be available to meet you, and you'd have to figure out some way to do that. And for the student, it might be effective if, if you have a really good connection uh, to study that way. But for the teacher, it's not very efficient because he's only teaching and only able to influence one student at a time. And so uh, a performing musician that can dedicate a day or two a week to teaching at most, is not going to really be able to have much of an impact. So, so how do you get the benefit of real time without it actually being real time? And that's where the video exchange comes in. Because if you were to make a video of yourself where you practiced it for a week and got it perfect and send it into your teacher, that wouldn't really be that useful because the teacher would not be seeing exactly how you play. They would be seeing maybe a, a non-representative perfected you know 30 take version but if you're um, uh, just filming yourself practicing maybe after practicing it and you're feeling okay about the way you're doing it and just recording it and sending it to the teacher it goes into his queue and waits for him uh, he doesn't have to be there at that moment to to teach you maybe he's uh, performing with the symphony at that moment um, so it's waiting for him in his queue, and when he uh, devotes some time to teach, maybe the next day or a couple days later, he's going to be able to watch your video and give you individualized feedback right there. So even though it's not real time, it still is very individualized. 
So perfection would be if you could get Ricardo Morales to meet you at 2 o'clock every Tuesday and work with you for an hour, but realistically, Ricardo probably isn't available to you in that way. So what we're trying to do is get the effectiveness of that and the utility of learning in that way, but in a way that's more efficient for Ricardo and allows you to progress at your own pace. So I hope that answers um, the real-time aspect to it. And just to, to add another question to that, so this is the question that always, there's two questions that always come up. One is how long does it take to get a response from my instructor? Because people look at this and say, uh, the two questions are how long does it take to get a response from my instructor, instructor and how many students can someone possibly have if they're doing this one-on-one -on -one interaction through video exchange? And David, while we have you up, maybe you can focus on that as well. Well, we've had teachers that have been with us for as long as three years now, and, and some of them have hundreds and hundreds of students, and uh, they're able to keep up with the videos that are coming in. Um, so we haven't hit a maximum yet. Uh, we have to ask the students to be respectful and not send, you know, 10 videos a day. Um, and we tell the teachers to be sure that when they are giving a, a lesson back, a video response, that they give the students something that's going to take them some amount of time to, to master so that you know they aren't going to be ready the next day to send another video. They're going to have to work on it for some number of days. And these kind of tend to keep the numbers manageable for the, for the teachers. So um, there's really no uh, number right now that I can state as a maximum, although I will say that all of these guys are finite, and so there is going to be a limit to how many they can take. Um, but at this point, we feel comfortable that uh, we have uh, the technology in place to allow them to teach as many as possible. Uh, it's conceivable that there would come a time when the school would fill up and we would have to put people on waiting lists um, because we don't want to inundate these, these great players because they are teaching, but they're also performing, and they wouldn't want to impact that part of their careers. George, I would ask you, how, how long does it, did it take you, does it take you to get video responses from, from your instructor? And speak freely, I know he's here. I would say it averages uh, a day and a half, probably a day and a half, two days max, uh, was the longest it uh, usually takes. Uh, but I'm, I know my teacher very well, so it seems like we already know the, the parts of my plan we're working on. but. Uh, I don't think it would be much different otherwise. But yeah, and, for me, it's been a day and a half. And to put that into context, you know, that's a day and a half of a, getting specific feedback from the teacher. But as you said before, yeah. you've got these these short chunks of hundreds of of uh, lessons to get through that you're working on at the same time. So it's really, I think, David's built a, just a brilliant, and the team has built just a brilliant system for really maximizing the potential of learning online and taking the best of scaling one to many with the 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 best of one on one learning and putting together a system that works for everybody and I know David and I see uh, Bill you're both uh, using part of what makes that work which is you each have remote studios that you work with and every artist uh, is set up with a remote studio that they can have in their home uh, there is a mobile version so when they're traveling. Um, you know, you can do video exchanges from anywhere. We have one teacher, uh, which we're going to release a video very shortly in our guitar school, Paul Gilbert, who we have video of him doing a, a video exchange in a car, traveling from the airport to a venue. And, Was he uh, driving? <laughs> <laughs> He's texting and driving and video exchanging. Um, so, so uh, you know, that. That, that is one of the, the amazing things, is we're creating the ability to connect in ways that are, that are both um, satisfying, I think, to the students, and we have questions around this uh, in Twitter, which I I'm, I'm apologize to the Twitter feed because we're not getting to very many of the questions, but, um, you know, there, there's a value to the student, but that is an example of where the value of the interaction between the student and the teacher is such that it's very compelling to the teacher to really want to pass that on and, and, and go to that extra level. So I would ask you guys, you know, we, we've talked about what it what the, the advantages are for students. What do you guys see as an advantage as teachers, as expanding in this way um, through technology to reach to reach more people in a different way? Well, as as, as David said, uh, the efficiency quotient is tremendous. 
when we can say one thing and refer students back to that one thing. It doesn't mean that the idea is that everyone, all the students are supposed to play the same way. It means that there are certain principles uh, that have to be um, uh, explained about any given musical idea. And when we only have to do that once, uh, and everyone can um, glean that information and take it from there, it's tremendously efficient. I mean, the idea of, of being able to work with so many people in that way is fantastic. And of course, the idea that we can be working with people from all over the world um, someone who's taking an audition in Australia can get information about an orchestral excerpts or in Korea, Japan, Europe. Um, it's it's a, a hugely exciting technology that um, is, is a, a wonderful resource for those of us on this end of the experience. Nathan? Uh, right. I, a lot of times I find myself talking for a while in a lesson and uh, then the student will just say, actually, Mr. Cole, could you just play that? I, I have my recorder on. Could you just play it a couple times that I have it? And I always laugh, and of course I'll play it. But, you know, now I've recorded my whole curriculum, and it's, that's done. You know, for hundreds of video lessons, it's, it's up there. And so anytime they want that, instead of hearing me talk, they can uh, see and hear me play it, and many times different from multiple camera angles. Something that's also fascinating um, it, that I found in working with the video exchanges is the ability to listen back to the student's performance a number of times before I make the comments. Instead of just doing it once in, in real time, I can go back and say, well, I think they're doing something funky here. Let me listen to that again. And you can sort of zero in in a different way as an educator um, before making the video response um, to listen to what the submission was. And, and really, um, I take... Uh, you know, really good notes as to to what I've heard, what I want to address, and re and I can plan what I what I want to how I want to craft the response to to maximize uh, the the practice time and the concepts I want to share with with the student. Great. Well, there, there's so many questions that uh, that we have queued up here and that I want to ask you guys, and I think we may go a few minutes longer than than three than the hour allotment that we have, if if that's okay. Um, but uh, you know, one of the we talked about uh, this being uh, focused on people who are preparing for auditions, whether that's auditions to get into university, into conservatory, into uh, a different orchestra, etc. What what do you uh, maybe talk about some of the common mistakes that people uh, that you see made by students uh, in the audition process, and and maybe sort of how you address that in your schools. Basics. Um, I think a lot of what lets people down on audition processes is the fact that they don't have their fundamentals down, and that's where the recorded curriculum comes in in the artist work site. Uh, they can go back, um, starting with how to hold the instrument and up through doing extended techniques and multiphonics and uh, professional things, but going back to, to sort of the basics of, of articulation, of sound, um, all this kind of stuff, um, and finding out, you know, how to perfect the craft, and then they can get coached on some of the details of the interpretation. But from my experience in listening to school auditions and also a lot of professional auditions from, from, the, uh, from the good side of the screen where you don't have to be playing and you can just focus on listening, um, it's become really clear that a lot of it just has to do with playing in time, in tune with a good sound, um, being making it sound easy, getting around the instrument in, a, in a, an efficient manner. And those are all things that are addressed in the, in the curricula that we've all designed. So uh, from that, uh, you know, I, I, most of, and if not all of you all, uh, are on the other side of the, of the table in auditions routinely, correct? Yeah, I mean, there's so many times so, sorry, when I hear an audition and I hear a really good player and then in one excerpt uh, they really just kind of fall on their face and I, I think, oh, if someone could have just had 30 seconds with them to tell them, no, that's not the right plan for this. Like, you, they're a really great player. They could have done so much better here. And, yeah, uh, sometimes that's all you need is just that one minute. 
Yeah, so and I think that's one of the advantages of the school is not only can I ask you questions about uh, this particular technique or get your input on on certain uh, fundamentals, but you know a student can do a, a video say I, I need to do this excerpt in an audition, you know, in two weeks. Can you help me? Where do you see my weaknesses? And, and they get the advantage of not only technical but also uh, you, you know. Uh, uh, common sense, professional advice on how to approach that. Well, we've we've all been on both sides of the fence. We've all uh, obviously for a while we've been playing in major symphony orchestras and have been listening on the good side, but we've been on the audition side as well, and we did have to go through that at, uh, in our own preparation in the sense of paying attention to basics, paying to uh, paying attention to fundamentals, and it was it was hard work. But we also, I'm sure, we played for others and. And this outlet with Artist Works is, is an excellent way to supplement in the sense of preparing for an audition or catching those things that you might be missing. And, and uh, even today, I'll just give an example a couple of things. I listen to my own playing in Artist Works. I, I have to, uh, playbacks, a couple of things are fine. I said, oops, I missed something. And, and I'm not supposed to talk about that. But, <laughs> I, I, but, there, but you know, it's like, I, I, and it's interesting, the things that I talk about in, in the fundamentals, et cetera, et cetera, well, I, 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 I see that I, I missed that as well. So, it, and, uh, and, and seeing that happen to myself, I, I think, well, you know, and this is just as good for a student or semi-professional or someone who wanted to change jobs, whatever, for them too. So it, 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 it is a fantastic tool. I'm not going to tell you which excerpt that is, though. <laughs> I was going to add real quickly that the, the advantage to the smaller uh, responses on an excerpt or something like that is uh, when you're working with artists of this caliber, uh, among students that I'm around, when, you're, when you talk about the great players, it's funny how much one phrase that someone gets in a lesson is the big thing that everyone sticks to. So for me, in a lot of my lessons, I will remind people, you need to stay in the meat of your sound because I've heard that so many times. Um, and if, say, I would have gotten one video exchange with Dave Bilger ever, and he would have said that to me, I could have. That that'll be the big phrase, and then it sits in you, and you you hear it, and you don't gotta get it beat into you because it's right there in the video exchange. And you can go back to and see it, and really find out that that's what you needed to get at. Perfect. Perfect. So let's talk a little bit of a question uh, that's come up. What? Is, Opinions. Does the the quality of the instrument that you play is that uh, make a difference in auditions and competitions, etc.? Nathan, <laughs> <laughs> everyone wants to ask string players because they're such. <laughs> um, you know, there there needs to be a kind of a baseline quality. I, I always think your <laughs> instrument needs to be able to project adequately. I and mean, it doesn't have to be the loudest instrument around, but it has to be able to show dynamic range. Um, and it has to have quality in all the dynamics. So an instrument's no good if it only sounds good when it's loud. It's when it's quiet, it also has to have interesting quality. And, you know, beyond that, it's really about more about how it fits you and what you can get out of it and how comfortable you are playing it, because everyone can hear if someone's not comfortable with his or her own equipment. Perfect. Sound good. So what kind of instrument do you guys each want to sort of tell? I'm sure people are interested in what, what brand, what style, what instrument you play. I play a Yamaha. Uh, a Yamaha, it's uh, my own design with a K head joint, which is K for Kaner. And uh, uh, I love it. It's a great instrument. It's, it's exactly what I wanted because I basically um, – designed it the way I liked it, so uh, that's what I use. And like Jeffrey, I have a Build Your Model trumpet by the Shires Musical Instrument Company that I designed recently, and that's, um, that's what I'm playing on. It's nice to have that option to have an a instrument company <laughs> make exactly what you want and what fits your face the best, um, you know. Yeah. Ricardo. Uh, well, I... Uh, I also have an instrument, a uh, uh, signature model that, that I uh, co-designed with a, a friend of mine from Vancouver. And uh, also uh, it has given me a great deal of, uh, of help because uh, when you're thinking about design, it makes you uh, get yourself out of the box also. And 
try to be more objective about what the instrument does or what it doesn't and finding the balance of what are the things that we uh, want uh, and the things that we like versus the things that we need, which is uh, extremely important. Uh, sometimes you'll be, uh, uh, um, you'll be surprised how many people end up uh, using something that they think that feels good uh, you know, particularly to them, but actually doesn't sound that good out there. So there, uh, for it's one of those things where you, uh, yeah, it has been a, a real uh, eye opener for me, and uh, it has been a great adventure to to do. Great, Bill. What about you? I, uh, the screen froze up, so the question was, what instrument do I play, or what kind yeah, of instrument? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, I, I play a Paxman. It was a, a a horn that literally showed up at my doorstep. Uh, back in 1987, and I uh, and I opened the box. A friend sent it to me, and I and he said I thought I might like it. So I've been playing it ever since. I've tried out a lot of horns uh, since I bought this horn, but uh, I keep coming back to it. And one of the reasons I keep coming back to it, and especially as a horn player, I, I jokingly say this, but I think it's true. This horn is a very forgiving horn, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> it it forgives me every time I play. So I, I'm very <laughs> Very fortunate in that respect, but there's there's some serious to that too. I mean, I uh, some horn players are notorious for missing notes and having problems, and and this horn just the, the zones are a little bit bigger, wider for uh, notes, and but I also have a larger palette to work with in the sense of dynamic contrast, tonal uh, opportunity. But on on the side of, of finding a horn that uh, or an instrument that one likes, I, I in the horn situation, I find that the a lot of people. Let the let the instrument control them. They they don't let they don't take control of the instrument, and and uh, so they're they're limited. There's other issues that I demonstrated on the on the website uh, that the the typical player bumps into, and hopefully through through the through the website they uh, work what I worked with on on certain subjects that they'll be able to play the instrument better, and they might find out that that is probably the right in instrument for them, or they might find out you know what I might need to switch. Gotcha. Nathan, what about your instrument? Um, well, the instrument I play doesn't belong to me. It belongs to my orchestra, um, and it's a Stradivarius, so I'm very lucky to play that. And the last owner was uh, Jack Benny. It was uh, his Stradivarius, and it's the one. <laughs> so it's, you know, every Stradivarius has a name. It's a name that for someone famous who played them, and most of the time it's a famous concert violinist. Uh, and in this case, uh, it's one of the most famous violinists of all. And uh, but yeah, you look at uh, look up his old shows. That's what he was playing, and it's a beautiful instrument. It's uh, so much fun to play. Made in 1729. Wow, you didn't get to work with the maker on that instrument. Uh, <laughs> but, you know, uh, I'd love nothing more than to go back uh, in time and uh, have a Stradivari design uh, to my specifications. <laughs> well, I'm a firm believer in having calm, assertive energy over the instrument, and not letting the instrument run my life. So, like like Bill says, you gotta. You know, he's the horn whisperer, and. Uh, <laughs> well, I, I keep thinking that my this violin is gonna remind me to you know not take myself too seriously and like you know keep keep some humor in what I'm doing and. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Well, good. I want to be respectful of your time there. As I said, there's a lot of questions that I didn't get to here. And I'll try and catch some of them in the wrap here as I kind of wrap it up. But I thank you all for your time. Um, you know, a couple of things that, that came up in questions, you know, um, is this, you know, focused on advanced players? And I, and I think I, I talked about where this is not a beginner's school, but at the same time, this is a school where an intermediate student can, can get a tremendous amount of value. Um, in, in uh, across the board, uh, there's curriculum there that, that begins with fundamentals, and primarily that's to be able to, as you guys said, if you've got somebody who needs some fundamental work, you don't you don't have to spend time personally with them. You can spend time with them on the details and the real important stuff, but you can refer them back. But that's available there to intermediate players as well. Um, we invite you to, uh, if you're watching this uh, broadcast on uh, live on uh, the Artist Works Classical Campus. Uh, you're right there to learn more about it. We have some free sample lessons uh, up available from everybody so you can kind of get in and see uh, what they look like. They're in full HD. Uh, get a sense of what it's like to take a, a lesson from David Bilger or Bill Caballero or Jeffrey Kaner, etc. You can, you can get a little uh, sample of that. Yeah, you won't be able to see the video exchange. You'll be able to see some examples of it, uh, but you won't be able to interact with it. But it'll give you a good taste of what it is. I should say 
the pricing of it is uh, three months of unlimited um, access to the, as we said, hundreds of lessons, uh, as well as unlimited video exchanges with your teacher uh, is $299. That's for unlimited access for three months. And we have uh, plans uh, that gets less expensive as you as you subscribe for longer. Uh, you get the lessons. You get to be part of the community that's built around excellence in that particular instrument and around that teacher. And you can interact with students, community uh, features there. You can communicate with each other, help each other out. You get access to all the video exchanges uh, that these uh, very accomplished uh, instructors uh, do with everybody. So uh, it's a very cool thing once you, once you check it out. So uh, you can go to www.artistworksclassical.com to check it out. And uh, gentlemen, thank you very much. This is our first live event. And uh, I think it went off swimmingly. And um, we're going to do more of them. So uh, keep checking back. Uh, if you have any questions about uh, ArtistWorks, the ArtistWorks Classical Campus, you can email me at ian, I-A-N, at artistworks.com, uh, and I'll be happy to answer any questions. Uh, in the meantime, check it out, artistworksclassical.com. Thank you, gentlemen, and uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and good luck with your schools. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you everyone. Thanks. Great to see you all. Thank you. Good, guys. Bye. Bye.